Hey there, good morning. It is Thursday, April the 29th, 2021. Welcome to the Morning Watch. Um, welcome. I'm just so glad to see you here. Um, let us know that when you are when you when you come in, let, let us know that you're here. Morning, Robin. Hope you guys rested well. Hope you slept good. Um, busy day today, I'm sure, for, for most of you. Um, hope it's a good day. Uh, the day is, the week is uh, wrapping up really quickly. So there's my mom, my sister. I don't see a Patty here yet. There's Peggy. There's my mom, Wilma, Robin, Peggy. All right, so today we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, one of my favorite, favorite chapters in Scripture, the conversion of Saul. We saw Saul already a couple of times. We saw him in Acts chapter 7. At the um, at the stoning of Stephen, we saw him there holding the coats of the people who stoned Stephen. We saw him in the next chapter when Luke tells us that he was uh, that he agreed with the killing of Stephen. He was um, he was a part of a he was a, he was a persecutor. The Bible says in verse three of, of chapter eight, he was going everywhere to destroy the church. That was his goal was to destroy the church. Um, Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Kim and Virgil, Rosemary, good morning to everybody. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this morning that you've given us. What a beautiful morning it already is. And just thankful that in the quietness of the morning as we start our day that we can dive into your word together, that we can pick it apart together, we can learn from it together, learn who you are, learn who we are. Thank you, Lord, for your cross. Thank you for seeing your son Jesus to die in our place. Lord, we love you. We ask all this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right. So, if you have any prayer requests, as always, please forget, I forget to say that sometimes. Please put those in the chat so that we all can be praying about those things together. Prayer is one of the greatest things that we have at our disposal as believers. Um, so, please do that. Let's read. <clears throat> so, starts out. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. What is the way? That was a term that they used to describe Christianity. Okay? So he wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Okay? Who was Paul? Very well educated man, uh, a Roman citizen, um, of. Uh, had a, a a strong Jewish pedigree, was a religious zealot, was, in his opinion, doing what he was doing to serve God, uh, because he felt like that uh, Christianity, the followers of Jesus, the way, all of those things were evil and wrong and should be wiped out. Okay, he persecuted Christians. He had them killed. He had them tortured, imprisoned, all of those things. So this is a guy that I would have written off, okay? This is a guy that I would have said, this guy is not someone that would ever be possible of saving. But this, this, this whole chapter, there's like three different places in this chapter, three different stories where it's proof that with God, nothing is impossible. What are you going through right now that looks like it's an impossible situation? Come here to this to this chapter. Read this. There's so many examples here of God doing what doesn't make any sense. If you think about yourself and you think about others that you know that you have talked to about Jesus, and they say to you, "I've done you, I, I've done too much. I, there, there's no way that God would ever save me." Well, bring them here. Bring them here to this chapter. As he was approaching Damascus, verse three, on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what to do. God pursues him. God finds him on the road to Damascus and blinds him with this powerful light from heaven. When you came to know Christ, that is a result of God pursuing you, of going after you. 
There's nowhere that you can go that you can hide from God. Nowhere. So don't give up. Just keep pursuing. He's pursuing you already. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the voice, the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, Go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so I can see it, so he can see again. So you see God working on in two different angles here. He's working on Saul. He's blind. He's going to be led by hand to Damascus. Jesus, this is the post-ascension Jesus. He'd already gone to heaven. He'd already he'd already he was already seated at the right hand of the Father. And yet God says, why are you persecuting me? And he tells him, go into the city and you'll be told what to do. Saul does what he's told to do. We see immediately, we see obedience. We also see um, incapacitation, right? Saul is unable to take care of himself. He can't see. But at the same time, he's working on Ananias. He tells Ananias, go and find Saul and pray for him. He says, but Lord, this is this is this is a real thing. Because when when you heard if you were a believer and you heard the name of Saul, it would have brought great fear to you. Because he was a man who would have you arrested and maybe killed for your beliefs in Christ. And so this is what Ananias says. I don't blame Ananias. He says, But Lord, I've heard the many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. We see fear here. Look what, the, look what the Lord says to him in verse 15. But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. The Lord gives him comfort in saying, I know. I know this is the guy, but he is the one that I have chosen. None of that matters. None of what he's done in the past matters. Go. Go and pray for him. Minister to him. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, <laughs> the Lord Jesus, who's appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. You know, Saul never forgot these moments. Saul never forgot these, his past. It burdened him. It was a burden he carried with him his entire life. You hear him in all of these, or two-thirds of the New Testament. You hear him reflecting back on who he used to be. You know, the devil can use our memories as a stumbling block for us to think about how bad we are. But God can use our memory to remind us of how good he is. God can save anybody. And we've been given the privilege of being able to share that message of hope with everyone we come in contact with. Look at Saul. Look at what God did to him. He changed him. He looked the same. He was the same person outwardly, but inwardly he had been transformed. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is indeed the Son of God. Man, he didn't let any grass grow under his feet, did he? First thing he did when he can get any strength back, he goes and begins to tell others about Jesus. He begins to preach the gospel. This is Saul. The guy that used to drag Christians out in the dead of night and take them to prison is now on fire for the Lord. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, they asked? 
And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priest? Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. After a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. They were watching for him day and night at the city gates. They could murder him, and Saul was told about the plot. Listen to this. So during the night, some of the other believers lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the city wall. Man, that's like Mission Impossible stuff. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe that he had truly become a believer. Because that would have been a sneaky way, right, to get at Christians, was to pretend that you're one of them. But this is not this is not what happened here. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told him how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told him that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. When the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus, his hometown. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. It's, it's just, just, this is just an amazing, an amazing chapter. Okay, so this is a couple other things here that we're, we're going to see. We kind of it kind of moves away from Paul here in this last part of this of the chapter. Meanwhile, Peter traveled from place to place. This is Peter now, and he came down to visit the believers in the town of of Lydda. There he met a man named Aeneas, who had been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, "Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your sleeping mat." And he was healed instantly. Then the whole population of Lydda and Sharon saw Aeneas walking around, and they turned to the Lord. They turned to the Lord. There was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. About this time, she became ill and died. Her body was washed for burial and laid in an upstairs room. But the believers had heard that Peter was nearby at Lydda, so they sent two men to beg him, please come as soon as possible. So Peter returned with them, and as soon as he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room. The room was full of widows who were weeping and showing him the coats and other clothes Dorcas had made for them. But Peter asked them all to leave the room. Then he knelt and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, get up, Tabitha. And she opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. She gave her his hand. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then he called in the widows and all the believers, and he presented her to them alive. You know, God presents us to the world today alive, alive in his spirit. Move from darkness to light, from death to life. The news spread through the whole town. And many believed in the Lord, and Peter stayed a long time in Joppa, living with Simon, a tanner of hides. And that's the end of the chapter. Hope today's blessed you. It, is, it sure has blessed me. Um, it is an amazing, an amazing chapter of hope. What is God doing in your life right now in a place that looks impossible, that looks hopeless? Know this this morning. Please do not forget this. With God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. Sometimes things aren't even logical, what he does. And oftentimes, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us, but it's real. Uh, Wilma says, remember my sister Joan? Absolutely. Kim says, please pray for my dear friend from San Francisco, Gina. Okay, we sure will. Uh, Ollie Roberts family, my cousin over in Clay County, passed away. Virgil says, pray for direction in my life. Absolutely. So let's all remember these things that we can pray for. We can pray for, for uh, Ollie's family. We can pray for Virgil. We can pray for Kim's friend. We can pray for Wilma's sister, Joan. These are things that we can do, that we that we want to do as followers of Christ and as brothers and sisters. You're, you and I are brothers and sisters. We're family. 
All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for, for, for your blessings and your mercy and your grace. <clears throat> thank you for your word that we can stand solidly on. Lord, we'll lift up Virgil to you. We'll lift up Wilma's sister Joan to you. We'll lift up Kim's friend from pharmacy school, Gina, to you. We'll lift up Ollie Roberts' family to you. Lord, we love you. We're just thankful that we can lift these people up that we love to you for your peace and direction and healing and mercy and hope and purpose and all of the things that we know come from you. Lord, we love you so much. And we ask all this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right. Y'all be blessed today on this Thursday. And we'll see you tomorrow. My youngest hope graduates from college tomorrow. And I'm so excited. It's tomorrow evening down at the University of Cumberland's, our, our alma mater. So uh, please pray for hope. It's going to be a good day. I love you all. Have a super day, and we'll see you tomorrow.